Good evening, everyone. My name is Carolyn No. I'm with the Academy of Science. We're very pleased to be partners with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you Conservation Conversations, generously underwritten by Cooper Busman. Many of you are Academy members and friends. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'd like to take just a moment to talk a little bit about us. The Academy is an independent science organization supported entirely through community contributions. We have been connecting science in the community since 1856 and have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. We offer a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming. You can find out more information about these programs on our website, academyofsciencestl.org. You can also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some, some of our literature that is on the table in, in the lobby out there. If you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there's an e-news sign-up sheet on the table out in the lobby, and I will also be passing around some sheets as well. If you are a student who needs to verify your attendance, please come see me after the talk. I do want to mention an event tomorrow that you might have an interest in attending. We have another conservation conversation tomorrow at noon where Dr. Greg Rasmussen will speak here at the zoo in the Living World Auditorium about the Painted Dog Conservation Project. The talk is free and open to the public. You do not need to register to attend. With that said, I'd like to introdu introduce Louise from the zoo. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm Louise Bradshaw. I'm the Director of Education here at the Zoo, and it's indeed my pleasure to welcome you this evening. We're very grateful to the Academy for helping get the word out about these wonderful talks, wonderful topics, and wonderful speakers that we have here through our Conservation Conversation Series. And then we also work with the Academy to host the Science Seminar Series, focusing on local scientists and local scientific areas of interest and inquiry here in the St. Louis area. In addition to the talk by Dr. Rasmussen tomorrow, we've got a couple of other ones coming up here at the zoo on November 20th. Um, our very own Mike Masick, who's the curator of birds here at the St. Louis Zoo, and he's also the director of conservation for the Humboldt penguin in Punta San Juan, Peru. And Mike is going to speak to the unique conservation challenges of saving this very vulnerable desert Humboldt penguin. Um, this is a penguin whose numbers have dropped very dramatically from several hundred thousand to less than 60,000 in the wild. And the St. Louis Zoo has had a 10-year commitment to helping preserve and protect this animal, working in a, in a real myriad of ways to help figure out how to deal with the problems of overfishing for the bird's main prey species, El Nino events, working with local communities and other conservation partners. And then in addition, next year on Tuesday, March 19th, um, Ingrid Porton, who's our curator of primates here at the zoo, and who also is in uh, charge of our Madagascar Fauna and Flora group, um, which is a collaboration of a number of different organizations throughout the world who are concerned about conservation of Madagascar's animals and plants. Um, she will be speaking on challenging times for conservation in Madagascar. Uh, that her area of interest particularly as lemurs, but that should be a really wonderful talk to hear about this very comprehensive approach to conservation in a very challenging environment. So tonight I have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Stephen Blake. Dr. Blake has spent the last 20 years working in the tropics as a conservation ecologist. Now, a quick show of hands, who's always wanted to work 20 years in the tropics as a conservation ecologist? So, like, we think you're awesome. Um, most of the time, he worked in the Congo Basin, where he worked with, for the Wildlife Conservation Society um, in a role, uh, a variety of different roles, working with forest ecosystem management, species conservation, and particularly with forest elephants, a really interesting, interesting animal. In 2007, kind of took a big shift and had the opportunity to live and work in the Galapagos Islands, where for the last three years, he's worked on the movement, ecology, and conservation of giant Galapagos tortoises. We're gonna to be hearing so much more about that incredibly fascinating project tonight. Most recently, he, um, Dr. Blake and his colleagues from here at the zoo, Washington University, Forest Park Forever, have initiated a study of box turtles 
that we'll be learning all about. These box turtles are here in Forest Park and also at Tyson Research Center. Um, in addition to all these wonderful accomplishments, he also works for the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology, which is based in Germany. And he's an adjunct professor at UMSL, adjunct researcher at the St. Louis Zoo, and a visiting scientist at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Blake. Much. Oh, thank you very much, Louise, for a stellar introduction. Hopefully we can live up to that uh, over the next hour or so. Thanks for the invite to come and give the talk here tonight to the Academy of Sciences and to the zoo. And um, thanks for everyone for coming out on a you know, Tuesday night when you'd probably prefer to sit at home um, and not listen to people talk for an hour. Um, so tonight I'm going to try and sort of cobble together a story that will explain the um, title of this talk, you know, tracking turtles from the volcanoes of Galapagos to Tyson and to downtown St. Louis. Um, so part of the talk will be about Galapagos, obviously, and hopefully we can wangle a transition to um, bring in St. Louis um, into that sort of discussion. So, yes? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm supposed to have one here, but uh, maybe I'll... How is that? Is that any better? I think I probably need to speak a little more clearly. Mumbling was always my strong suit. Put your hand up again if you, if you don't hear. Okay, thank you. So, on the Galapagos, um, as you just heard, we've been fortunate enough to work with giant tortoises for the last three years working for the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology. My boss has a fairly loose um, approach to so like taxonomy. So we've <laughs> we wangled a job with giant tortoises uh, with them. So what do we do out on Galapagos, the subject of the first part of this talk? Well, we study giant tortoise movement ecology, and we study the abundance and distribution of giant tortoises. And we work on... Um, uh, understanding health issues and health threats facing tortoises um, in the future. We work on understanding the uh, role of giant tortoises in shaping, perhaps, um, helping form um, uh, vegetation and plant communities on the Galapagos Islands. And we have um, a strong and hopefully soon to be stronger outreach sort of component for the project. So you might, you might ask, you know, well, surely this has all been done for giant tortoises, you know, one of the great iconic species um, on Earth. One would imagine that we know just about everything about tortoises, um, about giant tortoises. In fact, we really don't, and we're still at the infancy of understanding the ecology of giant tortoises and their ecosystem role um, and, and how these things feed into management and protection and better conservation of giant tortoises and of the islands uh, themselves. So, you know, where are the Galapagos Islands? Well, they're a little oceanic archipelago um, found about a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador, and they pretty much straddle the equator. And they truly are lost in the Pacific Ocean. Tiny set of oceanic islands, never been connected to the mainland, volcanic in origin, you know, lost out there at sea. So, you know, how on earth did these giant tortoises get there? You know, it's a question that, you know, who knows? Well, the answer actually is they floated. And they floated from the coast of um, South America, or at least one gravid female floated from the coast of South America, possibly more about three million years ago. And actually, you know, these tortoises are, are actually pretty good swimmers. They, um, their, 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 their body, their shell is sort of full of air, and they have this sort of perfect bell shape so that when they're, when they're floating, all the air rises to the top of their carapace, and they're actually pretty stable. And because giant tortoises are reptiles and they have very slim metabolisms, and they're cold-blooded, and da-da-da, they can um, sometimes go for one to two years without eating or drinking um, and still stay alive. So they're actually very well suited for sort of oceanic dispersal um, uh, from continents to mainlands. 
from continents to islands. Sorry. So thanks to the Humboldt current, which is coming up from the coast of Peru and Chile there, a poor old tortoise fell in or was washed into the ocean and probably spent six or eight weeks getting out to the Galapagos Islands about three million years ago. And once established on the Galapagos, whether it was one tortoise or many, um, chances are high that it was more than one occasion. From that first tortoise that arrived on the east of the archipelago, gradually over time, another tortoise fell in or was washed in from island to island to island, and gradually the sort of land surface area of Galapagos filled up with tortoises. Um, and almost all of the volcanoes on Galapagos now houses a separate species of giant tortoise, including these islands in red, which, are, which signify extinct species. The most poignant and mo most recent of those extinctions was when Lonesome George um, died, who was the last remaining tortoise from Pinter Island. So that species is gone. Fernandina, we're not quite sure whether there are tortoises there. There are a few reports over the last century or so. And actually right now we're looking for some funding to mount an expedition with aerial flyovers and an on-foot component to try and put that um, question mark to rest. Are there undiscovered tortoises on Fernandina? So as these tortoises moved throughout the Galapagos archipelago, in that sort of classic Darwinian um, evolution, they um, adapted to uh, the conditions on the islands on which they found themselves. And so they have this very spectacular ecological and morphological sort of diversity, and were one of the kind of key species that really got Charles Darwin thinking about, you know, hmm, how and why do animals evolve? Um, so these are uh, saddle-backed um, tortoises. They have this very high uh, ridge on the back of their shell and um, most likely that's to help them during um, arid periods. They live generally on low-lying, very arid islands and that, that saddle-shaped shell helps them stretch their neck up to feed on sort of vegetation, cactuses and other browse plants um, during severe droughts when there's no other food around. Then on other islands, this is a tortoise from um, Santa Cruz Island. Um, these tortoises tend to have a, a very domed shell and they tend to be grazers and browse on low-lying sort of vegetation. Um, and they're generally found on um, humid islands where there's a lot more ground cover, grass species and other things for them to, to graze on. And then finally, on some islands, there's this sort of intermediate form between the two that seem to do both a bit of grazing and a bit of browsing. So we tend to think of these giant tortoises on, on Galapagos as the, these weird sort of evolutionary quirks that happen to be alive on Galapagos and, you know, isn't it strange that we have giant tortoises on islands? That's not quite the, the full story. Um, in fact, living today, or another species of giant tortoises um, a few hundred miles north of um, like Madagascar on the Aldabra um, Atoll. There are about three or four species over there. And then peppered across the world are some sort of large-ish and medium tortoises found on most continents in both temperate and in sort of tropical um, areas. But what's even more remarkable is if you look at the sort of evolutionary lineage of giant tortoises, you find that, you know, basically the entire tropical and temperate um, world was full of giant tortoises, including these old things that lived in uh, Australia that had horns and club tails. Any of you uh, like, um, like Gary Larson? We call that a, a thagomizer. <laughs> After the late <laughs> Ari Thag, was it? So, you know, the, the, the point is there have been, you know, many um, giant tortoise species living around the world. And Galapagos giant tortoises and Aldabra giant tortoises sort of happen to be the last relic of this global lineage. 
and today we've just got these two species left. So then, of course, you know, the golden age of sail came, um, and we'd already eliminated the remaining giant tortoises on continents that climate change and um, other factors had, had, had already um, seen these species of giant tortoise dwindle. The only tortoises that remained after human beings basically ate the last sort of continental giant tortoise were found on remote oceanic islands that people hadn't yet got to. Then, of course, the ships came and the great age of sail. This is, a, this is a, a etching taken from uh, Mauritius, I think, soon after human beings first discovered that island. So not only did the dodo go, but the giant tortoises of Mauritius uh, went very quickly too. And the mascarines and other oceanic islands around the world. And then finally, the whalers found the Galapagos Islands, one of the greatest stocks of sperm whales on Earth in the early 1800s. So the French rocked up on the shore of Galapagos, the English, the Americans, you name it, everybody wanted sperm whale oil. And so the ships came to the um, natural harbors of um, um, Galapagos. And, you know, in those days, no refrigeration, no fresh meat, long voyages, sometimes taking months or sometimes taking years. Um, giant tortoises that can survive in a hold of a ship for more than a year without needing to be fed or watered were like the perfect source of fresh food for these long oceanic voyages. And so pirates and mariners and, and um, whalers took vast numbers of giant tortoises to sustain them as their primary source of protein on these long voyages. So gradually, um, giant tortoises, uh, giant tortoise populations diminished across the um, Galapagos Islands. And then, of course, um, any good pirate will think about coming back again in the future. And so they populated the Galapagos Islands with a number of invasive species, both ones they meant to leave and ones they didn't. Goats being one of the most devastating for Galapagos vegetation. Black rats make it just about everywhere human beings go. Cats, pigs, and dogs, and a variety of other species, fire ants, all sorts of animals have been introduced onto the Galapagos Islands by um, humans. And because Galapagos has a very unique, very special, very fragile e um, ecology, these species can wreak havoc with natural vegetation and with native species. So because of all of these things, um, a combination of direct hunting for food and invasive species competing for food with tortoises, tortoises became extinct on some islands. And today, um, goats have been eradicated from Galapagos. There are moves to eradicate um, many other invasive species, some of which will work and may work, some of which probably won't. A lot of conservation problems remain. And we think that you know, applied science can help management um, understand, better understand the solutions to some of these problems and feed into, directly feed into management planning. And that's where our project tries to come in and, and bring some added value to the work that the Galapagos National Park is doing by providing new information on the ecology and you know, life histories of, of giant tortoises and their ecosystems. So the sorts of questions that we're asking, you know, what are the spatial needs of tortoises? We don't know. How, when, where, and why do they migrate? Do they even migrate? Is it important? What factors disrupt movement? Human factors, roads, invasive species, development, climate change. What habitat resources are critical for um, survival? Do tortoises modify ecosystems? Are they ecosystem engineers in the way that Elephants in Africa, uh, maybe. And how, are the, how are those tortoise populations changing over time? Is management working? Is it not? And how should potentially repatriation of giant tortoises onto those islands where they've recently become extinct, how can that best be achieved? 
What are the best tortoise species to use to repatriate Pinter Island, for example? So the work that we do, um, hopefully, will feed into a number of these questions and help provide management solutions for conservation. So I'll talk a little bit now about the sort of science, applied science project that we um, got going on Galapagos three years ago. So we started on Santa Cruz Island, found in the heart of the Galapagos Island archipelago. You can see here um, very different habitats. Oh, I can actually move with this mic, can't I? Um, very humid highlands. This is looking from the south to the north. And the same winds and currents that brought giant tortoises to Galapagos also bring um, humid um, air that hits the um, extinct volcano, rides up the hill, and falls as rain. So very, very humid highlands, very arid zones to the north. And as you can see, um, hopefully, um, most of this humid area on Santa Cruz has been completely converted into farmland because there's a population of about 20,000 people living on this island. Um, so what, is, you know, what does conversion of natural habitat mean for Galapagos tortoises? Is it good for them? Is it bad for them? Um, can farming coexist? Um, and how can we best manage farming practices to maintain tortoises? So Santa Cruz was a really good place to start. It was accessible, had a lot of management problems, um, and the park need solutions to those problems. So very high habitat diversity along the altitude gradients of Santa Cruz. Tortoises can be living in these very arid cactus lava sort of dominated areas um, in the lowlands. And similarly can be hanging out in sort of like lagoons up in the highlands. So very rich sort of diversity of habitats that they need to navigate through. So we focus on movement ecology primarily using um, these uh, GPS units, which will take a GPS fix, so a location, um, about every hour with a battery life of about two years. So we use plumber's epoxy glue that we buy from Home Depot, just sort of down the road here, um, to fit these onto giant tortoises. My uh, permanent assistant, Freddie, is putting a tag on Jumbo. And uh, I'm uh, doing the same with uh, a tortoise called um, Negrita. And for any of you who know something about giant tortoises, these two tortoises are named after um, the first captive breeding pair of giant tortoises from the Zurich Zoo, who uh, are still doing well over there. In fact, Zurich funds some of the work that we do on this project. So it's nice to have a... Negrita and Jumbo roaming around the Galapagos Islands. So once the tags are on, they begin collecting GPS data, and they store them in a, um, a little flash card that's built, into the mem that's built into the unit. So once the tags are on, we, we then have to go and find the tortoises fairly regularly using traditional VHF tracking sort of techniques um, in order to locate the tortoise to get close enough to then um, use a modem attached to a laptop to remotely connect to the GPS unit and download the latest batch of data. So Freddie and I, particularly now Freddie, since I live in St. Louis most of the time, spends a lot of time traipsing around Galapagos trying to find tortoises. Once we get close enough, as I say, we can establish a two-way radio link with the tag and download the data. And this last photo I sort of particularly like because um, the chap that's downloading the data from uh, Sebastian, the tortoise here, is Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson, a chap called um, Randall Keynes. Um, and it was wonderful, not only is it wonderful just to be out in the woods with Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson, but, uh, you know, take him to see a tortoise that's most likely a good 150 years old and, and get him to, you know, download GPS data with, you know, silicon chips and goodness knows what. Uh, was, a, was a great thing. And so Sebastian could have been migrating up and down Galapagos when Darwin was sitting there in his office in Kent, sort of contemplating on the origin of species. Um, so that was a particularly 
Nice moment for myself. And for Randall, in fact. So if we're collecting data on tortoise movements, we want to understand why they're moving, where they're moving. So we also collect a number of um, uh, uh, data on a number of environmental factors that we think might influence tortoise movements. So we quantify rainfall, temperature, and vegetation greenness. And to quantify rainfall, we use these you know, sort of PVC tubes, two or three inches of oil in the bottom. They collect a month of rain, put a stick in the top of the tube, measure the rainfall, tip it out, fill it up with some oil, and uh, uh, wait um, to the end of the next month. So we collect monthly rainfall data using these. And with uh, these handy little devices that have come on the market in the last few years called um, eye buttons, we can collect temperature data every hour. So we collect um, shade temperature and sun, full sun temperature and full shade temperature, um, which for a cold-blooded animal like a tortoise is probably going to be an important um, factor, an important variable in determining where they go and why they go there. So we've placed a number of these weather stations up and down the altitude gradient of Santa Cruz Island um, in the heart of the two main tortoise populations to the west and east of the island. So we monitor vegetation greenness um, in DVI from uh, MODIS uh, satellite data from the NASA website, which gives us a monthly index of the greenness of the vegetation throughout the Galapagos archipelago. Um, and gives a pretty good approximation of vegetation quality and sort of quantity. So, lo and behold, when we download those GPS data um, from the tortoises and draw a map, we find we've got giant Serengeti tortoises because these Galapagos tortoises undergo, you know, a classic seasonal altitudinal migration, like, not the altitudinal part, but like Arctic terns or like Serengeti wildebeest, or numerous other species, barn swallows, numerous other species that migrate around the world. Giant tortoises just happen to do it on a fairly small spatial scale. The longest of these migration tracks is about uh, 10 kilometers from start to finish, from sea level up to about 400 meters. I'm sorry. Um, we, we played around with these data trying to, trying to separate out sedentary phases from migratory phases. So in this early map, the, 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 the red dots signify sedentary phases and the blue dots signify migration phases. So these regular return migrations seem to be driven primarily by vegetation so like dynamics. And this graph hopefully can explain that to some extent. If we start considering this particular tortoise, who's called Herbert, um, if we start thinking about his movements when he's up in the highlands at about 400 meters up here. And we look at this graph. So if you look at the green squares here, the, these green squares represent vegetation greenness. So at the start of the year, Vegetation's pretty poor. It's been a long, hot, dry season. Vegetation is sort of desiccated, um, and there's not, a lot of torto there's not a lot of food around in the lowlands for tortoises to eat. So they tend to prefer to be up in the humid highlands where we get these, these um, uh, very heavy cloud cover, permanent soil moisture, and therefore there's always some food available for the tortoises to eat, even though the quality might not be that great. Then the rains kick in at around about sort of January, and all of a sudden the greenness of the vegetation in the lowlands just blooms. You get a huge vegetation flush in the lowlands, and lo and behold, old Herbert decides it's time to move down into the lowlands to exploit that sort of salad bowl. Hangs around in the lowlands. All the while the vegetation quality is relatively high, and then some sort of threshold seems to be reached around about here, October, when the greenness of the vegetation becomes, or when the quality of the vegetation becomes pretty bad in the lowlands, 
And so Herbert decides to migrate back up to the humid highlands, where he can at least get some food. So that's sort of a simplistic look at why they migrate, or, but uh, we, think, we think it's probably the sort of primary reason um, is based on searching for food, okay. which is pretty unusual in a large reptile that can apparently survive for a year or two without eating. You know, why bother dragging a 600-pound um, body up and down a volcano just for food? So what does that look like? Um, speeding up a year of data into about 20 seconds, I think. So there's a female in red and a male in blue. The female actually doesn't bother to migrate. Whereas Herbert legs it up to the highlands as fast as he can when there's no lowland food left. And then after the rains, heads down again to the lowlands. Not quite sure why the female didn't migrate in this case. Perhaps smaller body, um, less absolute food needs. Um, she found enough food remaining in the lowlands during, um, during the dry season. Okay. So after getting some pretty interesting preliminary results on um, Santa Cruz, we expanded the study to other islands and to other tortoise sort of species on um, uh, Espaniola Island, which is a, a small, flat, arid island and the oldest of the Galapagos Islands at about 4 million years old. Continued working on Santa Cruz and then expanded onto Alcedo Volcano on Isabella Island, which is among the younger islands um, of the Galapagos. And on these islands exist other species and other forms of, of giant tortoise. This is an Alcedo male with his new GPS tag, fumaroles in the background. There's an Espaniola male, one of those saddleback types, and a Santa Cruz tortoise that we saw earlier. So with this sample, we, we hope to kind of sample across the range of ecological and human influence conditions experienced by giant tortoises, from um, arid low-lying islands where tortoises don't have the opportunity to migrate up to these high volcanoes up to about 1,000 meters um, above sea level uh, that have very little human impact where they can migrate under a different suite of ecological circumstances. So what's going on on Alcedo? Well, again, males in blue, females in red. Six months worth of um, data here. So not a great deal going on for the time being. A few tortoises sort of working their way around the volcano. And then all of a sudden the rains start and three of our tortoises have headed over to the, to the far side. And we think that a very similar phenomena is going on around this volcano crater um, on Alcedo to what's going on on the altitudinal gradient on um, Santa Cruz because of rain shadows and, um, and very differential rainfall on one side of the volcano crater compared to the other. But some of the tortoises on Alcedo undergo these vertical migrations too. This is spiky. A uh, female tortoise that we tagged on the top of whoops, on the top of the crater. So we tagged her during the dry season. She heads quickly down to the lowlands to feed and presumably to nest. Um, tortoises, giant tortoises also seem to nest in low-lying, dry, arid areas. And although food is seems to be the major driver of movement, obviously nesting and reproduction are um, going to be very important too. So the next phase of our study is going to be trying to figure out um, how um, feeding ecology and reproductive ecology sort of combine to produce these migration patterns that we see. So we're starting to produce a few papers out of this work now, which is so like gratifying. But you know, outreach is a component of the project that we put a lot of effort into as well. 
um, particularly with children. You know, kids on the Galapagos Islands are as isolated from nature as kids in, you know, downtown Detroit. Um, not that I've ever been to Detroit, but I can imagine what it might be like. Um, you know, there are rich kids on Galapagos, poor kids, you know, middle income families, as we've, um, you know, across the socio-economic spectrum, and all of them pretty much are starved of nature, um, which is kind of surprising when we have this impression of, you know, anyone who lives on Galapagos is living in ecological paradise. Um, it's not quite the case. Rules are very stringent on keeping even local people sort of out of the national park. Most people are pretty poor and simply can't, don't have the time and the money to invest in getting out into the highlands or the national park to see tortoises. So one of our goals is to try to translate the sort of science we do and the applied science we do um, and make that um, meaningful for local people, particularly children. So this is a classroom from the Thomas de Belanga School on Santa Cruz. I should so his mum knows I just mentioned him. This is our little boy, Charlie. When we lived on Galapagos, uh, went to Thomas de Belanga School. So the sort of main premise of what we do is to introduce children to the highlands to giant tortoises. It's quite a thing if you're five years old and you suddenly find yourself two metres away from a 600-pound you know, dinosaur, um, if it's never happened to you before. So we take students radio tracking. We introduce projects into their sort of curriculum. Um, this was a scene from an English class where, once again, we exploited Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson. And the um, high school students had to prepare an interview in English as part of their English class, deliver it, and then write it up in Spanish as part of their biology class. Um, so we've sort of managed to weave our way into several um, different aspects of the sort of curriculum for these um, youngsters. As I said, we take them tracking, explain the data, make the data available, come up with classroom activities, and exploit the little devils as well into making potentially sellable products that we can um, sell in the local tourist shops on Galapagos to get some money to feed back into that education program. We've had some success with sort of international internet um, things for, for uh, youngsters. This example is uh, the BBC World Class Program that attempts to find a, a common theme and bring children and young people from around the world to write about their experiences in ecology and nature in sort of a, um, a, a common forum. So a school class on Galapagos here wrote about the adventures of finding Lolo, one of our giant tortoises. We've interacted with the private sector and, and uh, produced uh, um, various goods, T-shirts and things that we sell and pump money back into the project and try and get some uh, well-known uh, figures to pose with uh, some of our kit to hopefully improve sales. So. Edmund Pensive, is it, from the Chronicles of Narnia, trying to tell Galapagos kids that it's cool to like nature. Not that they believed him, but we tried. So we've worked with the National Geographic on a few occasions. One example with uh, the uh, Critter Cam team, basically duct tape some video cameras, high definition video cameras onto the backs of tortoises to uh, get a tortoise eye view of the Galapagos Islands or rather a, a tortoise eye view of National Geographic cameraman. This is some video from a shot by a tortoise called Freddy. Kind of like a bad scene from Jaws. <laughs> Courageous people, these Nat Geo photographers. So Greg Marshall has wrestled sperm whales and fought great whites and all sorts of stuff. But old 
Freddy the Galapagos tortoise rather got the better of him. So hopefully, you know, with one more trip from Greg, if we can ever convince him to come back to Galapagos, we should have enough footage for a, a half hour Nat Geo special, you know, which will really boost the project, both, you know, in terms of sort of general PR and, and, and the interest and, you know, um, fundraising potential. Um, so it's great. Um, especially when uh, the photographer gets on the uh, bad side of a tortoise. You know, so that's some of the things we do on, on Galapagos, you know, so the challenge now for yours truly is to kind of weave that little story into something that's relevant to St. Louis. And, you know, fortunately we've got these little devils in St. Louis, you know, box turtles, you know, there's, there's probably a hundred hibernating box turtles within one kilometre of here in, in um, Forest Park. And Sharon, um, who works with the zoo, um, setting up a sort of conservation medicine um, institute here, and myself got into thinking about box turtles because some friends of ours, who hopefully they're not here, um, about a year or so ago, came to us and said, hey, you're a vet and you know something about tortoises, would you come and have a look at our box turtle? Um, so we say, yeah, fair enough, you know. So we go round to their house, you know. They're not in, are they? No. And, um, and so they take us up to the upstairs bathroom, the upstairs toilet. And there's a little plastic tray with about an inch of water in it. And this poor little box turtle sitting there terrified. And they said, uh, he looks a bit peaky, doesn't he? So we said, well, he, well, well, yes, you know, you would look a little peaky if you're in an inch of water in somebody's bathroom. You know, where did you find him? Oh, we found him in Forest Park. Oh, really? You know, wow, well, that's, that's amazing. Why didn't you leave him there? <laughs> you know, well, we thought he looked upset. And they thought he looked so upset that the previous week, before we saw them, they'd taken him on holiday with them to Florida and put him on the beach because they thought he was pining for the ocean. And these are smart people. I'm, I'm taking the mickey out of them dreadfully, but very nice people, very clever people, very astute. Um, but haven't got a clue about, you know, the fact that box turtles live in this part of the world and shouldn't be in your bathroom in an inch of water. So we, you know, mulled this over and, 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 and came to the conclusion, you know, well, wouldn't it be great to, to dabble in, in, in setting up a, um, a project that, you know, where we take some experience that I've got from Galapagos and, uh, and the conservation medicine experience that uh, Sharon has and, and, and see whether we can do something meaningful for box turtles in this area. And of course, as you know, you know, there are, there are many, many enthusiasts of reptiles in this part of the world. And we're not pretending to know, I certainly pretend to know nothing about, in fact, most of what I've talked about is all a bit of a sham, really. But um, I, I certainly don't pretend to know anything about box turtles. Um, but we have some basic ecology and some basic natural history and some basic conservation sort of, you know, smarts, one would hope. So that's how the box turtle project came about. And we talked to um, Alice from the children's zoo who had some spare cash um, to get us going with some GPS tags. Sharon had a bit of spare money in her budget to start looking at some health issues of, of box turtles in the area. So what do we do in St. Louis? We actually do very similar things to what we do out on the Galapagos Islands. We look at movement ecology and we look at health and we look at abundance and distribution, and we try to do some outreach. And what I'm going to explain now is basically a sort of a very um, um, uh, basic pilot study to see what's sort of potentially feasible to do with the institutions around here to start thinking about you know, what's going on with Forest Park um, turtles what's going on with turtles in this part of um, um, Missouri. So we work at the Tyson Research Centre, which is owned by WashU, and in Forest Park. And this project involves a very strong collaboration, really, now between WashU, the zoo, Forest Parks Forever, um, and, and everything we do 
is, is sort of geared around those three institutions. And of course, the Max Planck Institute, who I work for, but they're in Germany, so they don't really mind. So Tyson uh, Research Center is about 2,000 acres of primarily um, oak sort of hickory forest. There's a lot of other research, you know, high quality cutting edge research going on out there. And then of course Forest Park, we don't need to um, explain what that's all about. So, you know, if you walk around in Forest Park for half an hour and look under leaves and under rocks, there's a very good chance that you'll find one of these little fellas. So, unfortunately though, we don't really know, just like Galapagos, oddly, we don't really know how many tortoises there are, turtles there are in Forest Park. We don't know where they go. We don't know what conservation threats they're facing. Are they doing well? Are they doing badly? Are they just hanging on by their fingernails as a sort of population? Um, so these are the sorts of questions that we're trying to answer. So we used VHF tags as opposed to GPS tags to set up a little tracking study of the Forest Park box turtles. And this is uh, Jewel, uh, proudly wearing her tag. Jewel uh, is a fairly large female box turtle that lives up by the Jewel box. A little bit of forest up there. So working with WashU students over the summer um, and some high school students through the, the, the turf program, um, we track the weekly movements of these tortoises. VHF tracking is very labor intensive. You have to get out there with an antenna and actually find the turtle, which can be quite tricky. And only then can you get a GPS fix and you know, gradually build up a map. If we had GPS units on these turtles, we could get a fix an hour, for example. But GPS tags for box turtles cost about $3,000 each and a VHF tags of about 200. So the choice was clear. So we do health assessments to look at, to sort of compare and contrast the health of box turtles in Forest Park in, a, in an urban setting with box turtles in the rural setting out at Tyson. We do physical exams and body conditions, uh, various blood cell counts, uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, stress levels, and scan for infectious diseases such as um, like ranavirus, which has which uh, proved you know, very uh, much a threat to box turtle populations out in the east of the USA, for example. Quite a lot of populations, I think, have dropped by more than 50% when ranavirus goes through the population. Don't know if it's here yet or not, but the chances are it's coming. So what can we potentially do about it? And look at toxin levels too. So here are some basic movements of the forest park turtles. We've got a gaggle of four or five up here in the um, Kennedy Forest. A couple here by the jewel box. One over here not too far from Jefferson Lake. And a couple sort of over... Oh, I don't quite really know where that is. What do you call it? Over by Union Road there, is it? There we go. Thank you. So pretty discreet pretty small home ranges. None of the turtles um, tagged in the um, Kennedy Forest have ventured outside of the Kennedy Forest. None of the turtles in the jewel box forest have moved outside of that forest. So pretty discreet, pretty small ranges. As if we look at Tyson, you know, by contrast, um, got some enormous home ranges up to about uh, 50 hectares, which is a huge home range for a box turtle. Um, there have been numerous box turtle studies looking at movement ecology, and uh, Tyson turtles seem to be you know, among the biggest home, some of the Tyson turtles have among the biggest home ranges of any box turtle studied to date. So pretty different um, movement patterns going on there. Won't dwell too much on that because we've only got a, a few months of data. Um, we haven't yet got the results of the health study from Tyson and from Forest Park, but those data should be available in the next few weeks as we get blood samples worked up. So working with the zoo and with WashU and Forest Parks Forever, uh, we've begun some outreach, taking um, university students and high school students out into the woods to get them 
trained up in some of the methodologies we use and to just get them out into nature, getting dirty fingernails and enjoying being out in the woods. Had some quite good uh, press with the project earlier on in the summer, thanks, thanks to the zoo and to WashU on local TV and in a couple of the newspapers, working with um, school children from an urban school in um, St. Louis, taking them out to be introduced to the box turtles of Forest Park. Um, a schoolgirl friend of ours who worked with the pro on the project over the summer um, made a little Google Earth film of some of the um, turtle movements. The only stipulation I gave her was that in this film we had to fly through the St. Louis Arch. And I think she had about a day to make the film. So we'll see the story. So she'd never worked with Google Earth before, never made a film before, or dubbed music onto a film. And produced this, as I say, in about a day. So we did get to go through the arch. So there's Esteban's tracks as we fly over Forest Park. Hopefully we'll find uh, Snoopy and Kimmy in a moment. So on. Probably enough of that. So I think it's, you know, to me, this approach seems to work very well on Galapagos and here, where we can introduce, you know, young people to, not introduce, but in some cases introduce for the first time, and in, and in some cases um, get students out into nature interacting with animals, interacting with the woods, come back with a bucket load of data, put them into something interesting and fascinating like Google Earth, and make movies and make maps. And then you can play with these maps and start thinking about, you know, coming up with your own ideas and sort of hypotheses about, oh, those turtles in Tyson, what are they really doing, you know? And, and so this seems to be a very nice way to, to sort of bring a few different skill sets and, and infuse and hopefully inspire people to, to, to think about these things. A group of the undergraduates at WashU made a promo film, again, with very little notice from me. Um, we were supposed to do a census, and the census didn't work out, and we had a couple of days to go on their program. So uh, I asked them if they could make a, a little promotional film. This is Mum, a box turtle out at uh, Tyson Research Centre. Mum happens to have, I think, the biggest home range of any of the Tyson box turtles. Called Mum because she was full of eggs when we found her and put we the tag on. We started this project in April 2012 when box turtles were coming out of hibernation. Since then, we've compiled data of weekly movement for our turtles, as well as individual weights every other week. We mapped the movement data on movebank.org and the computer program GIS, or Geospatial Information Systems, which is also used to estimate individual home ranges. Each turtle we find is given a basic health exam to look at body contusions, scoring, lesions, and any signs of disease and ectoparasites. We are also taking blood samples to look at differences in stress hormone levels between urban and rural populations. 
If future funding allows, we will be able to study infectious diseases like mycoplasma and rotavirus, toxicology profiles, and even genetic diversity within the populations. In addition to the field-based work that we do, we aim to promote citizen science and connect our project to the St. Louis community. In June, we made a visit to South City Prep, a St. Louis charter middle school, to give an educational talk with the St. Louis Zoo's Wild Care Institute and taught the students how to track turtles in Forest Park. We did the same in July with Forest Park Forever's Voyagers program for local educators. We even had some great news hits on the Post-Dispatch, KSDK, and the Worcester Record. There will be many more outreach initiatives to come as the project develops. So that, you know, that brought, gave those students something to kind of focus their, 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 their thoughts on and come up with a new skill. Okay, it's a little three-minute promotional film. I think it um, very nicely describes the project. It's something that, that, that they can be proud of. Thanks to John, who's sitting over there, who introduced me to his friend Robert Pless. Um, we're toying around with an iPhone app that we need to talk to um, Forest Parks Forever about to see whether it's got any legs and whether we want to um, invest in using this sort of um, uh, uh, technology to get citizens interested in um, the box turtle project. And Robert developed this thing called ReFoto, which is an iPhone or a Droid application aimed at getting citizens to take consistent photos of objects of interest over time so you can monitor how they're changing. The classic one being, you know, um, glacial retreat, you know, 50 years worth of photos. You know, 50 years ago the glacier was there and today it's not. And one of the problems of, of citizen science using photography is that generally speaking, no two citizens will take the same photo in the same place um, at the same angle, etc. That presents big problems for people trying to analyze these data. So they, these um, computer scientists at WashU have developed this ReFoto program. So I literally met them by chance, thanks to John. Thank you, John. And we got talking about potentially using this application for tortoises, or turtles rather. So essentially, um, you download the application onto your smartphone um, and that includes um, a little outline of a turtle. When you see a turtle to photograph, you kind of line up, the, line up your, your image on the phone with the image of the, tur with the, with the real turtle. Um, so you get a sort of consistent size and shape. Click the button, take a photo. Up it goes to the ReFoto site, it's geo-referenced, date, time, the user, various other information that you might want to collect, and is available in this geo-referenced sort of data set that's linked to the photo. So that's got some potential uses um, for, again, infusing the iPhone generation into using their iPhones in the woods to, for, um, nature conservation applications. It's also got some potentially some strong sort of scientific um, interest in doing things like capture, recapture um, turtle censuses. As I said uh, um, a few minutes ago, I have no idea how many turtles are in Forest Park. An application such as this could actually help us get to um, um, a sort of population um, estimate using citizens. But of course, all of these things, you know, this is introducing people to turtles in a sensitive area like Forest Park, or out at Tyson. You know, I'm new to this area. I don't know how these things are going to play out. So at this point, having played with a few tools, we really now need to sit down with the, with the, with the managers of Forest Park Forever, the zoo, and other institutions, and say, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's going to be useful, and what should we drop? Um, so we're sort of at that stage right now. All of our data on Galapagos turtles and Forest Park turtles, actually, and Tyson, are available on the MoveBank, uh, on a website called movebank.org, um, which is a website geared towards sort of amassing as much of the telemetry data on Earth out there as possible into a single sort of like database, so that data from, you know, blue whales to bumblebees to bats to giant tortoises are all accessible in the same format. Um, so if you want to play with our Galapagos tortoise data and 
download them and make your own Google Earth images, uh, feel free. And so throughout what you know, I've tried to do in the projects that we've sort of described tonight in Forest Park and, and Galapagos is you know, really trying to integrate science and applied science with outreach and education to help conservation, whether it's on Galapagos or downtown Forest Park. And so with that, um, that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope that was useful. Any questions? Yes. Um, um, so tourism is really the the industry that's that's dramatically changed Galapagos over the last forty years or so. Um, the number of tourists has has gone from you know a few hundred forty years ago to I think about one hundred and eighty thousand a year um, now, and so that involves you know, boats, it involves staff, it involves, um, you know, fuel, it involves airplanes, it involves sort of building uh, a local infrastructure that can accommodate 180,000 people a year. So the local population of Galapagos has grown sort of dramatically um, in order to, to facilitate tourism. And of course, the more boats that come, the more planes that come, the more vectors there are for bringing, um, um, invasive species um, too. So I would say tourism is probably the biggest sort of industry changer on the islands. Yes? How big are? How big are the giant tortoises when they're hatched? They can be as small as 100 grams. So 80 to 100 grams. Um, and uh, reach sort of will reach reproductive maturity at probably about 20 25 years years of age possibly younger in the females yes what's the gestation period um, gestation period uh, is um, a few months it all depends to some extent on the sort of temperature um, but uh, giant tortoises and, a, and a, a lot of other tortoises have this sort of interesting um, adaptation of being able to store sperm. So a female can mate and then store sperm for, for like many years, up to I think seven years or so, um, um, and sort of fertilize her own eggs um, with, that, with, with that stored sperm. Um, so there doesn't really seem to be a very clear mating season on Galapagos. But there's a reasonably clear egg laying season um, from about June to October. And then the hatchlings tend to hatch the following January, February, March, which happens to coincide with that rainy season when you've got all this nice sort of vegetation growth. So um, who knows what the evolutionary mechanism is, um, but tortoises, young tortoises tend to hatch at a, at a very favorable time of year, which obviously makes um, evolutionary sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So figuring out who the father is is a, a tricky business. <laughs> Dave. Yeah, um, in fact, um, captive breeding of, of giant tortoises has been one of the sort of remarkable success stories of the Galapagos National Park and the Charles Darwin Research Station. You know, when those institutions were created in 1959, you know, tortoises were doing abysmally. The um, goat issues were, uh, goats were, were destroying the vegetation on sort of numerous islands. A lot of tortoises were still being eaten for local consumption. 
um, and populations are doing really, really badly. So one of the things that the park initially did was to create um, captive breeding programs for Espanola tortoises, tortoises on the island of Pinzon, which is a, tiny, a, um, a very small arid island where the old tortoises were breeding fine, they were doing very well, but all of the baby tortoises were having their legs, well, not to get too graphic, but they were being eaten by rats. So um, the adults were breeding well, but there was no offspring survival. So they were brought, uh, um, uh, a sample of adults was brought into captivity. Eggs were taken off of the island into a captive breeding center. Um, because in those days, they didn't know about things like you know, temperature dependent sex, so like determination. Um, in giant tortoises, as in a lot of reptiles, the temperature of incubation um, determines sex. Um, so they were incubating at the wrong temperature for the first few years, and it took a lot of time to really work out those, those kind of mechanisms. But thanks to those programs, um, the island of Espanola has been repopulated with tortoises, and that's now sort of a self-sustaining, or could be, um, a self-sustaining wild sort of population. Um, similarly, on, on Pinzon, that species has basically been kept alive by the captive breeding program. And later on this year, in fact, um, the, the Galapagos National Park are going to do a pretty ambitious rat eradication program on Pinzon. Um, and hopefully cure that, that problem once and for all. Um, in terms of sort of population status, probably tortoises are doing better at this point than they have at any time in the last century. But as economic development comes to Galapagos, as invasive species sort of wipe out natural communities in the highlands, potentially close off migration routes and things like this, um, there's sort of a whole new suite of threats that are, just, that are, that are already there and just around the corner um, that tortoises are going to have to, as, as are other you know, endemic wildlife of Galapagos, um, going to have to face. Um, Yeah, um, uh, the um, um, question was how close sort of to the tortoises do we have to be in order to download the data? Um, depends whether you're in foot or on foot or in a plane. Once in a while we're lucky enough to be able to use a, um, uh, uh, one of the local planes and because that we've got an unobstructed view um, from the air, we can download the data from a couple of kilometers away or, or, or more. When we're on foot, you know, it's the devil's own job trying to find these tortoises sometimes. As you saw in those photos, we, you know, tracking with VHF, very high frequency, is all line of sight. So we sometimes have to start out at the top of the highlands, you know, at the top of the volcano craters. And the tortoise might be 10 or 12 kilometers away in the lowlands. So we can get a fix you know, on a tortoise that's 10 kilometers away, you know, within plus or minus 10 degrees or something of the, of the true location. And then we descend, you know, down into the lowlands, and of course the signal disappears because you're in flat ground. And the tortoise might be behind a, you know, lump of lava or in a gully or who knows where. Um, so then you've got to look for a little outcrop of rock in the lowlands and try and get another fix. And so we, we spend many days looking for you know, apparently um, immobile, slow-moving giant tortoises. Okay, so what's the length of the Santa Cruz, where we, where we started, um, is about sort of 40 kilometers in diameter. Um, Isabella is about 130 kilometers long, but of course that's broken up into different um, 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 uh, sort of mountains. But the, you know, the, the, the problem is there, the, the you know, logistical problems of working on Galapagos. You know, Dave knows what it's like traipsing around Central African forests, and that's already pretty extreme. But on Galapagos, you've got no water, and you have lava, and everything's prickly. You know? So you, 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 it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult 
getting around um, on the you know, Galapagos Islands when you're a mammal that needs water. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? I would probably say, leave them alone. Um, I don't know what the, you know, probably the chances of suburban turtles surviving for very long might not be that high. And, you know, we've done nothing formal to date, but, you know, talk to a lot of older residents in the area around Forest Park and Clayton and that. And you talk to people who have lived here for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, and you say, do you ever see box turtles? They say, oh, you know, when I first moved here, we used to see them all the time. We had three in the garden. I haven't seen one for 20 years, you know. So, um, you know, everyone uses slug pellets. Everyone sprays their gardens. Everyone's got a car, you know. So, so, um, so the chances are, are probably not, not great for box turtles to make it in suburban environments. I suppose transporting them around to places like Babbler or Forest Park possibly depends on things like sorry, disease vectors, you know, um, um, which we really don't know anything about. Um, so, pending better information from a, hopefully there's a box turtle specialist in the audience that can uh, say something on that question. Right. Are they more adaptable than other species was kind of the, the main part of the question. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm dabbling in box turtle research for the first time um, and I've worked on, you know, Galapagos for three years. Certainly something like a, Galap like a giant tortoise that has the luxury of being able to live and without eating or drinking for two years a pretty flexible strategy, you know. You can, you can be washed off one island and crawl your way up another island and somehow make it eating cactuses and, you know, grass. Um, obviously, there's, there's some sort of ecological flexibility there that, that there wouldn't be for perhaps um, um, a small, warm-blooded animal, you know, that, that simply doesn't have that sort of physiological like flexibility. Um, box turtles here, I'd, well they don't seem, you know, there seem to be still a lot of box turtles around, but uh, the specialists will say that populations are shrinking and are, you know, dwindling due to habitat loss, the pet trade. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day that was coming up with some pretty alarming um, information about the turtle trade out of the Midwest and out of Missouri to supply uh, Asian food markets now, because of course box turtle, uh, because of course turtle numbers are sort of plummeting in Asian countries due to overconsumption. Apparently, there's a pretty vibrant trade in in um, in turtles, so you can be as ecologically flexible as as you want, but you know when when unsustainable hunting and habitat loss start taking their toll, um, then you're in trouble, I think. Yes? Well, I mean, you know, given the chance, who wouldn't, you know? Um, 
I, I think there, you know, to, it, it seems to me that the tortoise's strategy is, you know, if you can do it, you should do it, you know, because you don't know when you're going to meet another turtle. You know, so numerous, and, and of course we're at the very sort of infancy of understanding these movement patterns, and it's perfectly possible, actually I think out on Galapagos, that, that giant tortoises actually have a pretty sophisticated social system with dominance hierarchies and, you know, possibly flexible mating systems and all this other stuff that you would normally attribute to birds and, 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 and mammals. But, um, you know, if, if you're out there in the middle of the lava fields of Galapagos and you know, you run across, uh, you know, um, a potential mate, then, uh, then you should probably try your best to uh, do what you can, I think, you know. Oh, in a zoo? Yeah, yeah, I don't know that it'd be boredom. I think probably turtles probably t have one of the higher boredom thresholds of <laughs> anything on the on the planet, they're probably just randy, you know, I, I suspect that's, that's probably what it is. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Right. Right, and that, that's sort of a, a, an issue with translocating any, any animals anywhere, really. Um, you know, probably reinforces the rule that we should probably just leave them where they are if we find them. You know, unless they're in the middle of, you know, I-44 or something, it's probably quite a good idea to, you know, um, move them on. But... Uh, Yes, you know, animals have a home range because they have some understanding of the sort of geography of that home range. Although, you know, there's some nice studies out there that look at, that are, that are trying to understand my um, navigation in animals, and turtles have been a species that have been used um, to some extent where, you know, turtles are moved from their home range to various distances, and they seem to have um, very good navigational skills um, to you know, get back to where they where they um, came from. Um, so, yeah. Yes. You know, it's 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 funny that the, the agriculture is probably overall quite a good thing for giant tortoises. You know, most of the um, most agriculture is 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 based on on cattle, and the early settlers brought in a lot of um, uh, non-native species of grass because of their high um, uh, nutritional content uh, for cattle. And you know, tortoises are you know large herbivores that like grass, and what's good for cattle seems to be pretty good for Galapagos tortoises. Uh, they seem to do very well in farmland. But um, uh, amusing is the wrong word because it's not amusing when you're a farmer, but having worked in, in Central Africa with elephants where crop raiding and, and elephants cause all sorts of problems for farmers' crops, it's a pretty weird experience for me to arrive in Galapagos and have, you know, tortoise-human conflict around, you know, new maize fields, for example. I remember a farmer... You know, why planted a field of maize in the middle of tortoise territory? I've absolutely no idea, but he planted this field of a few hectares of maize. There wasn't a tortoise in sight, you know, cycling up to work the next, you know, two or three days later on my bike. You know, 40 to tortoises, you know, totally devastating this field. And the old farmers out there turning them upside down and spinning them around, trying to scare them, you know, trying to scare them so they won't come back. But, um, you know, they're, they're pretty persistent and uh, we laugh, but it's a, you know, it's an issue. If you're a farmer that's just planted a field full of maize and spent two weeks doing it, and in two days the tortoises have destroyed the entire crop, you know, you're going to be pretty irate uh, um, against giant tortoises. So, yes.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, there, there's there's obviously good habitat and bad habitat, and you know, migration trails that everybody seems to know, and nesting grounds that everybody seems to know. So there are, you know, there are sort of preferred areas where where tortoises tend to sort of congregate, including things like lagoons and 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 mud wallows. Um, um, as far as you know, social awareness and social um, organisation is concerned, we really haven't got much of a clue as to as to what those sort of mechanisms are right now. I, th I think probably I think you know turtles probably have very very good senses of smell. Um, um, the you know the, the the common wisdom is that their eyesight is very bad, but I'm not so sure. It's pretty hard to creep up on a giant Galapagos tortoise. So um, and you know yeah, ha ha how does it happen? Maybe one tortoise happened to go through that field, um, but how does that then become you know 50 in three days? Um, uh, interesting, intriguing stuff, um, and we really don't know. Or I don't anyway. Yes. Um, out on the um, like Galapagos Islands, no, uh, none at all. And um, the poaching seems to be very much under control out on Galapagos, which is which is kind of surprising because if you if you go on some of these exotic pet websites. You know, you'll see Galapagos tortoises going for twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars, and there's a lot of territory out on you know Galapagos. There's a lot of ways to to poach Galapagos tortoises, um, and it sounds kind of odd. You know, one of the first slides I showed was you know the lost in the Pacific Ocean. It turns out you know there's all sorts of things like drugs trading and things go on on you know the far side of Isabella and Fernandina there between you know Panamanians and Colombians or others who are who are who are who are trading drugs out there in the in the middle of the ocean so why not start trading tortoises i suppose import um, difficulties is probably the main the main issue there it's not very sort of sophisticated yet um, but the question here you know the, as far as um, st louis is concerned is is a very sort of pertinent one and one before we go any further with this project we really need to you know, engage with, with, um, with some I institutions that have experience of this um, here, certainly with Forest Parks Forever and with the other sort of urban um, sort of management of, of, this, of this area. You know, is the fact that nobody really knows that there's many turtles in Forest Park their saving grace? Or, or is it one of the biggest threats they face? You know, it seems that there are a lot of people out there picking up tortoises, taking them away, probably putting them back. Um, even with telemetry data, as you know, you know, it's incredibly hard to find um, um, a box turtle. But as this project evolves, you know, we, we need to be very cautious, I think, about, about flagging the presence of, of tortoises in, in these kind of urban centres. Well, don't know really. Um, we we started it sort of, wouldn't quite say on a whim, but started it on a on a very much pilot study basis. We think that it's got legs. You know, other people do. Forest Park Forever seem to like what we do. The zoo seem to like it. Washu seems to like it. Local kids seem to like it. So um, if everyone's happy with it going forward. Um, you know, we're, we're very keen to, to kind of fundraise and, and make it a much more sort of permanent, slightly more sort of professional operation than it's, than it's been to date. Um, so I would say there's, there's really no limit. It just depends on, on the support from the institutes, institutions that really matter, you know, like 
particularly Forest Parks Forever. Is it a, is it a benefit for them? Do they like it? Um, and should we keep doing it? Um, some of the um, VHF units have a battery life of three years, so um, they'll be out there for a while. Wow, you know, that's the, that should have been on the tip of my tongue, shouldn't it? Um, you know, I think, I think um, we're with the Forest Park and, and the Tyson project still at the stage of sort of, of sort of figuring out what we really want to do and what, and what we should be doing. I think um, um, uh, as far as engaging with the project goes, you know, if your school is interested in a trip out to learn how to track turtles next spring, for example, that would be fantastic. You know, we can, we can organize stuff like that. Um, um, I think giving us ideas um, on how to engage people exactly like yourselves to become more enthusiastic about, you know, not just turtles, but sort of using turtles as this sort of... Um, sort of uh, icon of sort of nature conservation. Um, um, and yeah, uh, following the project, engaging with it and providing us with ideas and um, support for the future, I think. And we, we haven't really got a forum yet for, you know, we haven't got a website, and we haven't really got a functioning Facebook page and stuff like that, um, simply because we're not really at the point of having sort of consensus with the zoo and with Forest Parks Forever and with ourselves on how best to, to roll it out. But I'm sure those, those sort of public portals will, will, will be kind of coming along soon um, on the zoo and Forest Parks Forever websites. Okay. Yes? I mean, that, nothing stops you doing that, that, that sort of classic, you know, mark recapture work. I think it's, no, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm with you. Um, that's, how, that's how people figured out what animals did before VHFs and GPSs and all this other fancy stuff came along. Um, so, um, you know, in a, sophistic, in, a, in a slightly more sort of, not really glamorous, but certainly high tech way, that's what we're looking into with this rephoto thing. You know, can we get a, a computer science guru to figure out a little bit of software that will do individual recognition of turtles, which is a, only an electronic way of putting a bit of nail varnish on them, after all. Um, um, so yeah, your point is very well, 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 well taken. Thank you very much.